Uh, so I think so we're going to get started to be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, so, because I've been out, I haven't had the pleasure of participating, but I want to thank everybody uh, for coming to this joint seminar series sponsored by HDR and FWCB. Uh, this seminar series, as I think many of you know, focuses on conflict and cooperation, everything in animals and human society, a lot of different potential going in a lot of different directions. Uh, it's my pleasure today to uh, welcome Professor Joanna Lambert, who is down the road at the University of Colorado. But first, what I want to do, which is something that I learned in Canada, and then I've seen that here is that we acknowledge the land whose land we are now sitting or standing on, and that would be part of the ACU, the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, and the Ute. I feel very animistic, and I think of people as part of nature, so I will just recognize that before humans we had mammoths and mastodons here as well, and other species from man to animal. With that said, um, At about the time Joanna became a real adult, meaning 21 and legal, half of her life had been spent at Oxford and the other half in Chicago. So those are where her roots are. I want to point out that she's had a distinguished career as an evolutionary and community ecologist, somebody who focuses on coexistence and competition. And she is one of two and a half conservation biologists at the University of Colorado, which by contrast makes us here a very, very uh, overpopulated. Um, prior to joining the faculty at Boulder, Joanna was an endowed chair at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. She was also on the faculty at the University of Oregon in Eugene. And she's known for her academic skills, and she had been a, a director at NSF uh, for a period as well. Among the kind of species that she has published on, so there are several carnivores in there, some of the quite rare kinkajous and binturongs. She's also published on sloths. And the kind of journals that she's published in include Nature, Science Advances, Conservation Biology, Biotropica. And she has a new book out, Chicago Press book, due out next year. So I'm not going to dwell on the fact that she's an elected fellow of the European Linnaean Society, or AAAS, here in the US. But what I will do is I want to tell you a story. And so I asked Joanna, and said, you guys don't want to share secrets with me. So I asked Joanna, what is her one event that she seems to be most proud of that nobody knows about. And so you don't want to share those with me, but I'm going to share that which she told me because this is OK to share, I hope. Uh, and it is this. Uh, she spent time in prisons. And she's gone, not maximum security, but prisons where you have murderers and you have rapists and not the kind of people you want your mom or your dad or your daughter or your sister or husband or wife to meet. And she's done it not to inspire them about science, but she talks to them about animals. Hi. <laughs> thank you, Joel. That was a wonderful, wonderful introduction. And thank you all for being here. I want to especially thank the committee that put this together, uh, Tara and Kevin and Joel and Mike and Kathy sponsoring this. It's really great to be here. And I can only envision more and more of such collaborations between CU and CSU, which I think would be just a natural fit, sort of. Um, working on the, the strengths of both universities. So um, before I get started into the meat of uh, my talk, I first want to acknowledge that everything that I have done, everything that I am going to be talking about today, 
could not have been done alone. I've had a number of really remarkable collaborations over the years, and in particular, want to highlight the incredible efforts of many, many field as assistants in the field, uh, uh, in Uganda particularly, and especially Agaba Aramosi, my project manager who keeps things going when I'm not there, uh, my student, Dr. Aju Efion, who is now at the Forestry Commission in Nigeria. I'll be talking about some of her work today. Uh, I will be talking about my former postdocs, uh, Dr. Inza Kone. He's here receiving the Whitley Prize from uh, Prin Princess Anne. I'll be talking about some of the work that he and I have done. And then also a really um, productive collaboration with a uh, geographer and social scientist at CS, or excuse me, at CU, uh, Dr. Joel Harder. So thanks in, in advance, not at the end when everyone's exhausted, right at the outset. So my overarching research program, without getting into any details, centers on the ecological, evolutionary, and conservation consequences of mammal feeding biology and nutritional ecology. Right. One of the many sort of arenas in which I have worked, I won't by any means tell you about most of them, has focused on animal adaptations for consuming fruit, which might not seem that profound, but in fact, as I hope I'll demonstrate, it is in fact quite profound in terms of the consequences for forest regeneration, which is what I've spent a lot of time working on, and then what happens to forests and the people that live around those forests when the animals are no longer there, right? So this sort of summarizes uh, big picture about my field work and although I muck around in labs sometimes, I'm not by nature a laboratory person, but I do some lab work, I consider myself uh, by and large a field biologist. And I have spent many years uh, in different sites around the world, but primarily in equatorial Africa. Um, I'll be talking to you today about work that I've conducted in Uganda, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, to a lesser extent in Rwanda and Nigeria. I will in particular be talking about Kibali, and I'm many, some of you might have heard of Kibali, right, and may know of it as a national park. I will be just referencing it as Kibali because when I started working there, it did not have that protected status. So I've been working there long enough to see the transition from a reserve where there was a lot of extraction of forest resources to a fairly well protected national park, which has been an interesting kind of journey in and of itself. So today's talk um, is a bit of a departure. It's a bit different than the talks that I normally give. Um, I'm not going to be delving into any particular data set. And it really stems, what I've decided to kind of capitalize on, and um, I beg your indulgence, is the fact that I'm at a point in my career where I have some a sort of meta-awareness right, of the things that I've done, the things that my colleagues have done, and how these things have changed throughout the decades, right. I've been going to Africa for many, many years, spanning uh, durations of time on the continent, anywhere from about a year and a half, um, going several times a year. Now, many fewer, I, I'm not going as much, I've got other things going on, other obligations, and what I have been finding is that upon my return, I experienced something that, I, that we might call cognitive dissonance, right? And cognitive dissonance, as defined by the psychologist Festinger in the 50s, references the inner drive to hold on to our attitudes and to our beliefs in harmony, right? When they clash, a discrepancy is evoked, resulting in a state of tension known as cognitive dissonance. And this is what I've been experiencing, really starting in the 2000s, late 90s maybe, but really in the 2000s, that upon my return, I just had this uneasy feeling, and a feeling that I couldn't readily resolve. And that more and more, it, or, you know, in, as we get into the 2010s, it would just take that much longer to get over it. And what I've realized is that working in, on the continent, where I've been working for as long as I have, has been enough time to witness, whether I was sort of cognizant of it or not, extraordinary change. 
right? So these are photographs that I've taken. What you're seeing here is right, you know, post Idi Amin, post Abote, what Kampala looked like when there was no one on the streets, when cars were uncommon, to scenes of Kampala today in the capital city that look like that. Right? From uh, very, very few paved roads, two or three in the entire country. Primary means of getting around was on foot. I remember when bicycles from China showed up, and that was a big deal. To scenes like this, massive highway production uh, by international companies. Scenes like this of the forest, and this is what has gotten to my heart, as I'm sure, uh, as with all of us, scenes of forest that look like that to this. Right. And then scenes of some, some of my study species like baboon, Papio anubis, that look like this. Back in the day, we all might have an image of baboons being everywhere. They're trashing garbage. They're running into your house. They're jumping on your car. Back in the day, baboons, I hardly ever saw them. It, I was told that they could not be habituated. They were the rare, and since then, I have studied them in the deepest sort of interior part of the forest. But back then, they were very difficult to observe. And now we see them all over in these degraded habitats. And lest you think that this is sort of a melancholic, sort of nostalgic journey of the way things were in good old Africa with quinine water and hurricane lanterns, right? Which is, I don't want to evoke that image. What I want to evoke is that, in fact, this dissonance is something that we can capitalize on because this dissonance has influenced the very questions that I ask and the action that I take, right? And I think this would sort of speak to many of us in this room that are working on urgent imperatives, right? And with this idea of dissonance, I'm borrowing here from Pramadi et al. in a recent publication, thinking about what to do with dissonance and how it arises, right? So we have an inconsistency between the belief, the notion, the vision of what I had of equatorial Africa, right? That is inconsistent with what I was doing, the questions I was asking what, and what I was doing. So we've got a lot of cognitive dissonance here. There's only a few ways you can resolve that. You can change your perception. You can change your belief. Well, I can't change my belief. I've got photographs of how it used to be, right? Um, or you can change your action, right? And this is what I'm going to talk about today as I go through sort of this transition of the types of questions that I ask and the action that I engage in, right? So that many of us in this room remember going to graduate school or even undergraduate, and I was told at the time when I said I wanted to study, you know, two really easy taxa to study, primates and carnivores, <laughs> I was told uh, that I had to do it, if I really wanted to understand evolution and ecology, I had to do it in pristine habitat right? Undisturbed habitat. Find a national park. Find an area where there are no humans, right? And this was in the endeavor for basic science. And of course, we all know that back in the day, NSF didn't even have a broader impacts requirement, right? As indicative of that time. Oops, sorry. Um, to now, questions relating to adaptations, and this is where I am now, adaptations in anthropogenic habitat to determine the selective pressures in empty forests and in forest fragments, with the action being very problem-oriented. And the question is, sort of what happened in those intervening years? And I won't spend time on most of this. Uh, I'll spend time on the top few here, but extraordinary change on the continent, as we all know, right? Many wonderful, wonderful things, uh, incredibly moving moments of human interaction that I won't have the time to talk about. But other things like demographic transition, extraordinary population explosion, along with economic shifts that took Western Europe and the United States several, well over 100 to several hundred years to go through, have taken place within a generation. Parks increasingly as islands, a voracious bushmeat trade, which was not in place when I first landed there, but now and in starting in the 90s exploded, along with all of the other uh, astonishingly challenging uh, human humanitarian issues of genocide, civil war in the Congo, 
roads, along with all kinds of other infrastructure, Ebola, and I'm mentioning this not only because of its impact on humans, but its impact on many primate species, notably the great apes, and what that has done to uh, great ape populations. So my goals today with this sort of setup are to first explore the ecological interactions among plants and animals and the humans that rely on those plants and animals. So really this is getting at that seed dispersal and um, sort of ecology part of my work with regards to feeding. But then evaluate how these interactions have changed through the lens of human population increases, land cover change and the bushmeat trade with the idea that we can use this for action, right, and capitalize on the dissonance of how things have changed and how we see them. Now, I've already mentioned that I'll be talking a lot about Kibali in Uganda. I don't, do I have a laser? Yeah, I don't know if you can see. No, it doesn't work. Anyway, I'll point uh, Kibali up there in the westernmost portion of Uganda at the border with DRC. I'll be talking about Thai National Park, which is on uh, the western portion of Cote d'Ivoire, on the uh, right up against Liberia, and then also in the Cross River State in Nigeria, right up against Cameroon, where uh, there has been extraordinary change as well. I want to tell you about how paleotropical forests work. This is, the, this is part of the story that relies on seed dispersal and animals moving, um, s providing services for plants. I want to tell you about then the shifting human context, getting at that empty forest and resilient, resilient species piece, and then what to do about it. So how paleotropical forests work, this is one of my study subjects uh, in, in Kibali. I did not take that photograph. Um, how paleotropical forests work, I'm going to give you the story and then break it down a bit. Um, the first is that plants require animals to disperse their offspring, their offspring being seeds. It means that healthy tropical forests require animal seed dispersers. Which, and, and the other piece of it is that humans rely on forest resources that are dispersed by primates and other animals. But animals are in decline. Enough lag time now. We are seeing shifts in forest regeneration. And knowing these relationships can influence what we do about it. So seed dispersal, many of you know what it is, but for um, those of you who haven't spent time thinking about it, very simply, it is in the plant's best interest to have their offspring taken far away, right? And what this does is to reduce the density-dependent mortality that's associated with the area right below the parent tree, where rodents come in, where fungal pathogens attack fruit and seeds, etc. So there are many ways of moving a seed, and up here in more northern latitudes, we're more likely to see modes that rely on abiotic factors like wind or water. Right? In the tropics, it's animals that make things happen. And in short, the way more specifically uh, we could think of animal seed dispersal um, as being seed dispersal from the animal's perspective is dinner or lunch or breakfast. Uh, seed dispersal from the plant's perspective is offspring survival. So it's this incredibly um, important evolutionary and ecological interaction that's been going on since at least the origin of angiosperms over uh, 60 million years ago. So what the, I'm going to break this down very quickly for you. In short, in the tropics are a bit different than the temper and then temperate systems. And especially paleotropics, it's been estimated that upwards of 98% of tropical trees rely on animals to move their seeds. Primates are, in particular, important in these systems. Uh, in the forest that I've spent most time in, roughly 94% of those tree species have adaptations for attracting primates, in particular, to move their seeds away, so having uh, really pulpy, adhesive, sugar-rich um, uh, pulp around seeds. I don't want to make this into a simple thing. It's actually extraordinarily complicated. We don't know the vast majority of what's going on. Multiple species are involved, complex interaction networks, uh, bats, birds, like this great blue turaco, black and white cast hornbill, elephants absolutely are important. 
but across sites, it is primates, and across sites meaning the sites I work at, but then also in other work in the paleotropics, both in Asia and in Africa, it's primates that are moving the most seeds. Right? And I just want to kind of show you some of the details of this, just to c convince you of this, and I'll talk a little bit about Kibali primates. Uh, it's a fantastic place to work if you're interested in primate feeding biology. Uh, there are 13 sympatric species of uh, primates. I have worked with seven of them. I've got a few examples of those species here. What I want you to take note of are the broad categories or taxonomic uh, tax, or excuse me, the taxa that I have here. I've got collabine monkeys represented by black and white colobus and red colobus. I've got cercopithecine monkeys. Especially, I want you to note that little red-tailed monkey. Uh, oh, goodness. That little guy right there. Um, six species of cercopithecine. And then in the forest I work in Kibali, there's one ape in uh, chimpanzees. So what I'm showing you here, this is a bit, uh, and it's not a great slide, and I apologize because there's just too much going on. But what I'm trying to convince you of here, this is an extraordinarily large data set based on over 40,000 hours of direct be behavioral observation of what animals are consuming. And if you compress all of that into a massive pool set, looking at these two subfamilies of Colobinae and Cercopithecinae, uh, versus apes. The piece that I want you to take away from this pooled feeding data is that apes and cercopithecines are spending the vast majority of their feeding time, and also as we measure it in wet weight, it works out as well, uh, on fruit. Right? So they are true frugivores, or truly adapted um, fruit cons consumers. Colobines are leaf eaters, which makes sense. They're the leaf eating primates. They have uh, the digestion to do so. so Primates eat a lot of fruit, and primates can be very abundant. And this is part of the story, right, as we're losing this abundance uh, from uh, work with Chapman, Strusaker, and others. Um, Kiwali in particular is, is very rich, I've already mentioned species rich, and also abundant with, and these are just the most common species, this is not including many of the others, but upwards of 423 individuals per square kilometer, which is a lot of kilograms of primate, right? Uh, so there are a lot of them, and they move a lot of seeds. If you have information like I have of how many fruit go into the mouth in a minute, how much time is spent during a day consuming those fruit, how far you move from morning to the end of the day, you can get a rough estimate of how many seeds those animals are eating if you also go through the labor of counting the seeds in the different fruit species, which I've done. <laughs> um, and what I'm showing you here is uh, just the number of large seeds. I don't, it's impossible to do the small seeds. Those are the figs, right, the ficus species, too small. Um, but all those cercopithecine monkeys are moving in terms of square kilometers per day over 100,000 seeds, and this is discounting all those small seeds. Chimpanzees are very much less ab abundant, uh, moving fewer, but all of this is what we would call high quality seed dispersal. What we find in Nigeria, and this is Edu's work, um, in Cross River State at several sites, another way of looking at this is to look at the adaptations of the fruit species themselves. Primates consume different kinds of fruit than, than birds and then by abiotic um, modes of dispersal. And what she has found is that 99 of the 127 species that were on her transects have adaptations for a primate seed dispersal, almost 80%. Um, of those, and here is her array of, of species. There are gorillas, uh, the very, very rare uh, cross uh, river gorilla uh, subspecies there, as well as western chimpanzees. Another piece of the, the puzzle is that seeds do better when they're dispersed by, by, by primates. 
uh, one of, of a number of data sets here. Uh, this is Strychnos mitis being processed by that little red-tailed monkey, a Cercopithecine. And then uh, me monitoring what happens to seeds once they've been dispersed versus fruit that is, have just fallen below the parent tree. And you can see orders of magnitude difference, right? Especially striking is that in those seeds that are dispersed by, by this little guy, these red tail monkeys, weighing about three kilograms on average, 49 times fewer seeds die from fungal pathogen, pathogen attack. 6.9 more seeds are likely to germinate, and then 12 times more to act actually result in uh, seedling establishment. So uh, really important effects on the fate of those seeds. And the other part is that most of the animals that arrive to trees to move those seeds are, in this forest and elsewhere, are primates. And so these are just numbers derived from dawn to dusk tree follows, which sounds kind of funny because you're not actually following them. They stay put. Um, it is as tedious as it sounds because what that means is sitting below a, the base of a tree for 12 hours waiting to see what comes up. It's usually quite tedious um, until the elephants arrive. Uh, can I say? <laughs> um, and so what I found is that anywhere from about 80 to 100 percent of the visits to these fruiting trees, these are some of the most common tree species in the forest, are, are um, primates. Uh, Cercopithecines, again, those monkeys, not the collar beans, but the monkeys, the most reliable visitors, especially red-tailed monkeys. So I've been documenting all these effects. Uh, Inza has been documenting, Edu and the other parts of the, of the continent, other scholars. What's been going on outside the parks? Right? That's what I want to discuss and kind of evaluate the shifting human context of this and start getting a, a real feel for this. And really this is addressing some of those images that I, that I presented at the outset. And at the considerable risk of sounding like I'm making a prime mover argument, which I am not, decidedly not, I do, I must bring up population, human population. Because in the time that I have worked there, there has been a 250% increase in human populations. Extraordinary change in the total number of people that live there, uh, resulting in shifts from about eight, 80 to 90 people living per square kilometer to well over 200 individuals per square kilometer. And this, of course, is the story around the world, right? We all are fully aware of this. In Africa, we have, uh, there are about 218 million people living in poverty. 64% of those individuals are not in urban centers. It's still a rural continent. And 90% of those individuals are using biomass or fuel wood for their energy, meaning pulling down trees and, and, and creating charcoal out of those trees for their energy. All of the areas of the world except for Europe, with the exception of Europe, are, are projected by about 2050 to have considerable increase in human population, but it's Africa that stands out. Right. And we can look at this in any number of ways. What you're looking at here is one of the often uh, sort of projected images of population around the world. And there are absolutely hot spots of population going on around the world, indubitably. Where I want you to kind of focus is this bit right here, which is where Kibali is. That's a hot spot there. This is a bit pixelated here, I'm noting. But what this is showing as a close-up here, and here's some of the cra uh, crater lakes that are like Lake Albert, George, Edward, along the uh, border of Congo and Uganda, um, really dramatic human population increases. This area known as the Albertine Rift of Congo, Burundi, Rwanda, and Uganda has the highest human uh, density on the continent ranging from about 200 to 700 individuals per square kilometer. So what does this mean? Okay, so I've already mentioned it's about a 250% increase uh, from s roughly 17 and a half million to 43.7 million as of a couple of days ago. World Watch Institute projecting that Uganda is on track to have the highest growth rate on the planet. 
right? This is a very young population. An entire generation was lost uh, in the AIDS epidemic, and we now have a very young population. The age structure of the population is such that it's only going to um, sort of max out. So what you're looking at here is a um, Google Earth image of the region in which I work. Again, those lakes distinguishing Uganda uh, from Congo, Lake Albert, Lake Edward. And this area, I'm hoping you can see that red, and I'm sorry, this is red and green. Um, um, but uh, what, what I'm showing you here, this is what Kibali looks like, right? That dark green island um, that has been in place uh, since an, it had protected status. And what I want to sort of step through with you is how the land cover change around Kibali has, uh, has gone down. Okay? And this is with work, uh, work in conjunction with Joel Harder, a uh, geographer who spent and done a lot of really great uh, work, not only in the Albertine Rift, but in North America as well. And what uh, we're looking at here is change in forest cover in the Albertine Rift in general. Right, so we've got non-forest to non-forest, non-forest to forest, forest to non-forest, et cetera, in these various colors. Uh, this blob right here, that little green, is Kibali. And up, I'll show you a closer picture of that in a second, but up against, you may not be able to see it in the back, but around that park are all the, the red blobs, right, that are indicative of forest to non-forest, right? Uh, much of the area is non has in the time that we've been looking at this is shifts from non-forest to different kinds of non-forest. This is the stuff that is readily observable and is having the greatest impact now, right? Um, I showed that bigger picture of of the park, highlighting that western portion. This is a close-up. So what this big green element here is the, uh, the northwesternmost portion of what is now Kibali National Park. And that is the park itself. Outside is, of course, a matrix around the park. And in these Landsat images stemming from 1984 to 95 to 03 to 2008, which is the most recent that we could access for this analysis, um, you can see the dramatic shifts from habitat that sure had some impact. This is, I don't want to overstate this too much in 84, but with a, still a lot of remaining forests and papyrus swamps, really important habitat for elephant, to what we see in, this is already 11 years ago, the situation is more dramatic now, um, mostly crops, bare ground, and tea plantations around the park. Uh, a lot of data here, um, what, and this is just analysis of fragment size, right? Fragment size within parks and outside of parks along sort of a continuum from 1984 to 95, just after the park was created, to 2003, which is already quite some time ago. And the story, if you look at all of these individual columns, we don't have the time to go through them right now, the big picture, of these columns is that inside the park we're observing canopy consolidation, meaning that there are fewer sort of gaps, right? Or essentially, if you want to think about Kibali before it was a national park as being an area with large frag or area fragments with large gaps, essentially what's happening is that those gaps are filling in, right? As patches, those patches get bigger, right? And fewer while the exact opposite phenomenon is taking place outside of the park where we have more fragments and uh, very much smaller f fragments. And these, no matter what, how you sort of measure this in terms of density, distance to nearest patch, are telling the same story. So we've got consolidation in the park suggesting that it's working, right, as a protected area and then increasing fragmentation outside. So that we get images like this, and this is indeed um, some of the photographs around Kibali, forest ca canopy to horticultural matrix. Uh, increasing number and smaller forest fragments, classic, this is tea plantation. Uh, abrupt forest edge. So in sum, we've got Kibali that was contiguous with forests from in the DRC and other forest reserves. 
in 93, I'll never forget the day, I was the only one in camp when the forester came in with a sign under his arm and hammered in the sign that said National Park, which was kind of an existential moment of like, wow, it happens like that. Um, so, <laughs> um, so Kibali gazetted as a national park. Um, between 90 and 19, dramatic human population shifts, increasing uh, conversion of habitat, but consolidation of the forest in the park with the result of Kibali as a protected island, effectively. So the impacts on primates, those seed dispersers, those interactions that are going on inside the park, um, too many to, to get into the details of. What I want to focus on are these Circopithecine species here, the resilient species. Uh, the story is, is, as I'll tell you, that primates are declining everywhere and dramatic, uh, dramatically, right? Some aren't, and we all, probably anyone that in this room that's been to Africa has seen an olive baboon or a yellow baboon, vervet monkeys. Maybe you've seen a red-tailed monkey. They are not as resilient as baboons. So what we're finding is that with very few exceptions, like these guys, primates are particularly, among mammals, particularly vulnerable to habitat loss. And what we're left with then are resilient, highly flexible omnivores. Right? Sounds familiar, right? Here in North America, we're left with raccoons and um, coyotes, et cetera. So, um, and I'm gonna bring this up later before I go there, I just want the big picture of what is happening with primates, although we have these resilient species. This is um, a piece that came out just in 2017. A group of us got together to do a big mega uh, review of what is happening with the world's primates. And indeed, the case is that the order of primates is the most um, uh, vulnerable order uh, among mammals, right, with 60% of all species threatened with extinction and 75% of those species undergoing population decline, right, which is heartbreaking for all of us. Habitat conversion and the bushmeat trade, indubitably the two most important uh, variables involved, but the pet trade is still rife throughout the world and disease has been a very powerful impact here. Um, and this is not just in Africa, that we've got all of these effects, with the exception of Ebola, uh, taking place in, on all continents where primates are found. The bushmeat, we've talked about land cover. I'd like to touch on the bushmeat trade, um, which I, the only word that I can, you can come up with is voracious, uh, in, inexorable. Um, it's no, no, inver, no vertebrate is invulnerable to it. Um, and right now, we've probably all seen images of pangolin, right? Somehow pangolin have come into social media, um, probably because there's no primates left. And what happens is that hunters take different fauna after the primates are gone, because indeed primates are the most vulnerable and differentially impacted in bushmeat. Um, this started to erupt, I remember this is the work of Carl Armand and others, uh, uh, Mike Fay uh, with WCS, um, started to emerge as a crisis in the early to mid 90s, right? I did some work in Ivory Coast right at the border of Liberia, which is always tricky. Um, and what I found is that in initially when I was surveying some of the bushmeat there, it was about 90% primate. Um, eventually, what I'm looking at here is uh, Potomacorus, so mostly just bush pig, right? And uh, with a few, ex a few diker in there. I asked this woman who stands at, so this is right by the Kivali River, which separates uh, Cote d'Ivoire from Liberia. Uh, this, you can see the troops in Liberia brandishing their AK-47s, and I asked this woman, you know, when was the last time you saw a chimpanzee? And she laughed, and, uh, and I asked her, my very bad French, and she said, you know, il n'y a plus de ch chimpanzee, right? There are no more ch chimpanzees, and she laughed. There are no more primates. And these are images from across the continent, some of which are mine. And the question is, what is this doing? It's more than just the loss of the animals, it's the loss of the forests. Um, there's lag time between, right, uh, because of the nature of forest regeneration, but we start to get reports on the effect of losing animals really in about the early to mid-2000s. 
Um, and the story is, is that, you, as you might expect, in the absence of animals, and particularly primates, all kinds of genetic and populational structure differences, plant and breeding depression, lower species diversity, small seeded species pervasive, and in Kibali, projection of if primates were lost, over 60% of tree species gone, all of which are those large seeded species. So the effects are um, dramatic. Uh, Edu has found in her, um, in her work in Western Nigeria um, with a design that had three sites and at those sites a unit that was hunted and then protected and found that in the hunted sites uh, in the design, either no primates or very few. Um, and what happens is then there are these interesting community assemblage uh, shifts, right? So that then more seed predators like rodents and ungulates are popping up. So very different kinds of interactions in terms of dispersal and predation. Um, and what we find here, and again, this is with uh, looking at hunted and protected sites, primates versus other mammals versus abiotic uh, vectors. Uh, in hunted sites, the seedlings, not the canopy, but the seedlings are uh, much more likely to be plants that are dispersed by wind or water or, um, or bats, right? Um, and there's no functional equivalence. So the animals are not moving those large species, right? So. What does this mean for animal, uh, for the humans that live around the forest? Work that I've done in Uganda and Ivory Coast and Nigeria tell a very similar story, right? Africa is a rural, um, a rural continent, it's becoming less rural. In this work in Uganda, and this is old now, this is done, I did this in the late 90s in surveys, I found that 42% of the plant species dispersed by primates are used by local Ugandans living around the park, right? And these are used in myriad ways for medicine, for food, for, for uh, any kind of, many cultural uh, rituals, buildings, materials. Cercopithecines are moving most of those species, apes to a lesser degree, and it is very similar in Oak, Ivory Coast as well, with humans living around Thai National Park. As you found, um, she looked at this a little bit differently, doing a number of household surveys and found in her 147 that she uh, did ethnographic work with, 120 of those households use, and this is at the time that she was doing this was in um, sort of the mid-2000s, um, mid to late 2000s, 120 of those households use fruits and seeds from trees that are dispersed by primates. And then also uh, a few of those households acknowledging the use of bushmeat and there were shifts in the use of bushmeat throughout her study from at the beginning it being primate, but as those primates are hunted out, rodents as the primary meat, uh, primary meat being conserved, or consumed rather. So in sum, going back to that kind of spectrum of sh change, We've shifted from a species-rich, abundant fauna, dispersing diverse plant species, a kind of a porous boundary of ecological interactions in and out of the forest, because humans are using those forests, to a less diverse, resilient fauna, dispersing fewer, smaller seeded species into an anthropo, uh, excuse me, anthropogenic matrix, with humans having fewer and fewer options all the time right, for the use of those forests. I want to end on a, on a different note than that, because of course that's what we all do, right? We have to. Um, I want to think about what we do about the situation, right? And I just have a few slides here to kind of pull things together um, as we think about uh, work in Africa or anywhere, really, where we've seen such dramatic changes. And really, you know, there are any number of ways we could talk about this. Um, we could talk about it in terms of some kind of tripartite kind of strategy, very different tactics in protected area versus the matrix in urban. I'll talk about that. Uh, what could we do in particular with an emphasis on the matrix, right? We haven't lost everything. And a focus and emphasis on those resilient species, the ones that are doing well, um, might be of 
some utility, and then also using that cognitive dissonance to at sort of um, catalyze, if you will, action. I should say, action against the insidious, right, insidious shifting ecological baseline syndrome, and I want to spend a second on that. So, yeah, absolutely, we're going to use different tactics in different types of systems, right? Uh, protected areas, there's this great word that I learned recently, Russian word for forever wild, right? Um, and in the case of Kibali, parks can work. There's been some very recent analyses, even one coming out last week in Frontiers, um, demonstrating that, in fact, human livelihood around parks can be enhanced, right? So they can work. We've law there are many lessons, and they don't always work, and there are a number of failures, but they can work. Urban centers, right? The urban ecologists, this has been a, a, a really interesting lately, uh, not so much done in, in Africa, but uh, work done in Australia a couple of years ago, demonstrating that, in fact, urban centers can be biodiversity hotspots because of this kind of release that goes on for certain species in urban centers. What I want to talk about just very briefly is all this stuff, and I put that in a bigger square on purpose because this is what we have most to work with. Right? And I want to just sort of emphasize that it's not that we're losing it all, right? It's, it's bits and pieces, right? In some cases, we're getting more of some things while we're losing other things. And we've got more of these guys right here for sure. So one way of thinking about what to do with this matrix kind of habitat in a conservation setting, using moderately resilient species that can be an umbrella. Right? And baboons aren't particularly good at this. They're too resilient. Right? These taxa are more interesting when it comes to thinking about umbrella species whose conservation confers protection to a large number of naturally co-occurring species to which I would add and their ecological interactions like ecosystem services such as seed dispersal. The question is how you choose. I wish Erica were here because this comes right from Erica Fleischmann's work. How do you choose a taxon, right? Of all the ones that are out there, how do you choose? There's really some nice ways of doing this based on richness of the taxon, the co-occurrence, the rarity, and the sensitivity. And when you go through all of these various indices of, of species vul vulnerability, Lo and behold, in the work that I've done, it's the genus Cercopithecus that prevails. Most notably because they are moderately sensitive. They're not completely sensitive in the sense that we're losing them utterly, but they're not so insensitive that they're like baboons and they won't tell us anything in terms of, of an indication of what's going on, right? And so with the genus Cercopithecine, or ger genus Cercopithecus, we also get those great seed dispersal effects as well because they are moving. I've got a lot of data showing all of the seeds that they are moving out into the matrix for, that recruit and do well, right? I also, and this is my final just note on this because I want to bring it back to that cognitive dissonance, which in a way is sort of the opposite of a shifting ecological baseline or a baseline sy ecological baseline syndrome or SBS that became particularly apparent to me once I started bringing students in who would experience this but who had not experienced this and who experienced this and think it's incredible, right? Wow, look at all that forest. Whereas I look at that and think, ugh, what have we lost, right? So. As I've no noted, it's evident when you're in the field with students, but this kind of shifting ecological baseline is really different by context, right? So that in regions with slower demographic transitions and landscape conversions, like in this is kind of a complicated slide, but this is perceptions of forest change in Japan that took five to 10 generations before there was environmental amnesia, right? In the case of much of the world where there's the highest biodiversity, i.e. around the equator in developing countries, this ecological or environmental amnesia is occurring within a single generation, right? Within the lifetime of an individual scientist, right? Which I 
going to twist this around and make it into a positive thing and say that this means that we can actually do something about it because we can document it, right? And use this to catalyze action. We can, like what Joel and I have been doing, right, with documenting that forest change, what Adieu has do, been doing with documenting seedling shifts, which facilitates responses like rewilding, like planting buffer trees of known feeding tree species in the matrix that can attract seed dispersers like red tail monkeys. That by making flagship species, or excuse me, resilient species flagship species. Let's make red tail monkeys sexy in some nonprofits, you know, sort of icon, right? Um, so this is how I'm going to end, right, to use that cognitive dissonance, to use that feeling of just overwhelming sort of like change and do something about it so that we might end up with things like this. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate your time. I know I talked a long time. I don't have much time for a question, but I'm happy to answer anything you might have. Mm -hmm. You have done a wonderful job of making me feel not very optimistic. <laughs> so I want, I want you to get back to the optimistic yeah, side of it. Yeah. I have some experience in Southern Africa where yeah. private landowners around yeah, parks absolutely. have been encouraging wildlife. But the systems are so much different there than where you are. Yeah. Are we just left with isolated islands of parks and a little bit of work outside in the matrix that might lead us to false optimism, or can we change it back to some other state? <laughs> wow. It, um, yeah, I could t talk a long time about this. I'd need several beers <laughs> to do so. Um, um, what are we left with? You're right, absolutely, South Africa is completely different, right? I mean, the way that land is held and the land tenure itself, and then also total human population density, um, utterly different. Um, likewise, Botswana, which is often touted as, you know, sort of a success story of a tactic to, to um, conserve species, very different economically. They've got diamonds, right? And they also have extraordinary wealth from ecotourism and very, very few people. Um, so it's going to be modulated as a function of the distribution of, of where humans are, right? Some, and, and the good news is that, it, I guess, I don't know how to balance, I don't know that it's good, but there are areas of Africa that have been impenetrable for many, many humans, right? So vast regions of the Congo, vast regions of the Congo, where we are literally still encountering and documenting the presence of upwards, this has just came out over the last few years, things like, you know, 80,000 unknown, you know, grade ape individuals, right, of both gorillas and chimpanzees. Um, so uh, in pockets around, around the Congo, particularly in uh, Central Africa Republic and Congo Brazzaville and then uh, western portions of the DRC. So in areas where human population densities have remained low for whatever reason, whether it's a function of civil war, which has been horrific across the Congo, or a function of just total productivity or the, the economy of that region. In those areas where we have fewer people, it's just a different story, just as the, the story in, in uh, South Africa is a bit different. I think that um, the pro there is I mean, there's a change in the sensibility. People are very aware, not just the scholars in McCary University, but people living and dealing with this. People are very aware of the shifts. And I've seen sort of grassroots uh, efforts, you know, for tree planting that have been very successful. And that, and that in fact, can account for some of the land cover changes, even around Kibali, where there are species left, like red-tailed monkeys and black and white colobus. So. Sort of pessimistic, but sort of optimistic. Yeah. Are there any incentives provided by the government, like for like, like, you know, they pay them for not cutting down the forest, like outside in the matrix area? Because there's a lot of like um, payment for environmental services inside. I mean, Costa Rica has it. That's in Latin America. Right? Yeah. In Costa Rica. Is there anything similar like that, or efforts like? Here? So one, th yeah. So fuel wood the use of fuel wood and ch charcoal has changed in some regions and this is in large part the result of 
infrastructure that I was talking about, so electricity coming in. And there are efforts to uh, bring in uh, more, f even with that biomass energy source, uh, to bring in much more um, energetically efficient fuel wood um, stoves. So though there are initiatives like that going on for sure that have influenced the rate at which things are getting cut down. <laughs> question the data you presented about the use of natural resources around the protect around the valley was really interesting but I wonder in the context of that really rapid single generation change in so much which has brought in a lot of imported goods like plastics you know for everyday use concrete for building materials I mean how much do you know about whether people are preferring to still use those natural resources or whether there's a preference for imported goods um, there is a preference for imported goods for sure, but it, coming along with that is also um, an awareness of what those imported goods, namely plastic, has done to the area and an and, and acknowledgement of, yeah, and I've had these very explicit conversations, an acknowledgement readily of we want these things, I want a plastic chair to sit on, and I want uh, plastic bags at the same time as noting plastic bags are everywhere and the government is doing nothing about it and why won't they make plastic bags illegal like it is in Rwanda or, or Papua New Guinea or whatever so yeah it's that duality and that you know that our ability as humans to maintain multiple kinds of inconsistent perspectives on these things is, is very real there so very much an awareness of these changes within a single generation but at the same time wanting a piece of what we all have had. I'm conscious of so it's like the person creeping. I, I feel like, like Donald Trump was with Hillary during the uh, debate. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Joanne. Thank you all.